uh, to your ego and pride as critics. People that just nitpick, you know. And, uh, and here's a man, Paul, he's talking about it. Well, you look at verse 15. He said, Some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife, and some also <clears throat> of goodwill. The one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. And it's hard to believe there are people that actually, they preached right, and they believed right, but they lined up in opposition to Paul. Yeah. That's hard to believe that was going on. <laughs> Think about Paul. Think about his responsibilities. Think about his importance uh, to the New Testament church, especially back there uh, in the early church and the spreading of the gospel. And these men, their motive in the ministry was to add affliction to his bonds. They wanted to oppose him. They wanted to hinder him. They wanted to get in his way there. And they preached, he said, Christ of contention. They preached Christ of contention. Now, again, <laughs> what a thing. Uh, Paul, is he's not physically whole. He's got his own hindrances and things he has to deal with. And yet there's people there that when it comes to his ministry, they're on the wrong end of the rope. <laughs> there's a big tug of war for all of us, amen, as far as whether or not we're going to serve the Lord or not. Amen. Listen, the devil's pulling on one side of that rope. Yeah. You understand? The devil's against you this morning. Yeah. You understand that? Yeah. He just soon you stayed at home on this rainy day yeah. has to come to church. He just assumed that you didn't ever pass out one track. You never witnessed anybody. You never tried to lead one person to Christ. Right. That you took your money and squandered it at McDonald's rather yeah. than supporting a missionary or buying yeah. a Bible or yeah. doing something there that's profitable in eternity and laying up treasures in heaven. Listen, he'd rather you just waste your life. That's what he'd do. And he'd get on that end of the rope and he'd pull on that end of the rope. Now, the Lord, he's for you. Amen. Yeah. He wants you to serve Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, you know why? Because he's in your corner. And the best thing about your life is it's an opportunity. And you've got a chance during this opportunity. Some got a greater opportunity than others, and some have more time than others. But all of us have opportunity to serve the Lord. And we're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ with how, in regards to how faithful we were with our opportunities that we had and the gifts that He gave us and the, and, and the doors that He opened, how faithful we were to go through those doors and follow Him in His will and do things in His timing. And God, of course, he's got all that down, Pat. And, and, and he wants you to lay up treasures in heaven there because that's to his glory. That's to his honor. Uh, because you and I, in order for us to do that, we've got to get out of the way. And, uh, and when we die to self, then the Spirit of God begins to bear fruit and the, the gospel begins to go out and people begin to witness not only the message, but they witness the man or, or the woman in some cases. And uh, the light goes out and it's fruit to your account but it's to His glory because it was His work in your life. That's why when those fellows get those crowns there in Revelation chapter 5, what do they do with them? They throw them at Jesus Christ's feet. You know why? Because He's the one that's worthy. Those guys realize, look, you give me the crown, but the only good that ever came from my life was because of you. And so when the Lord, He leads us to bear fruit and lay up treasures in heaven, it's to His glory. So God's for you. And there's a great tug of war <laughs> trying to make sure, one, to get you out of the fight, and the other side trying to make sure you stay in the fight and you stay just as profitable and fruitful as possible. You know what I, I want to be? I want to be on the right side of that rope. Yeah. I always want to be an encouragement to somebody that's, that's in this thing. I, I don't care. Listen, some folks that aren't even at church today, I don't want to write them off, amen, because I want them to return. I want them to be back in the fight. I, there's some folks there, listen, man, that a lot of Christians just washed their hands of and gave up on. I don't want to do that, amen. I want to be on the right side of that rope. Yeah. And you think about the Apostle Paul. <laughs> and here's a man that is serving the Lord. Jesus Christ, and there's no doubt about it. And yet people are preaching Christ of contention, supposing to add affliction to his bonds. They're on the wrong side of the rope when it came to the ministry of the Apostle Paul. What an amazing thought. But he says, they're the other of love, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. In other words, they, they're trying to encourage Paul. You know, they were so they admired Paul. They recognized that here, here's a man of great faith. Here's a man of great sacrifice. Uh, here's a man who loves the Lord Jesus Christ and is completely dedicated toward the furtherance of the gospel. Here's a man that, uh, that his life is about seeing people saved and seeing churches established and preachers trained. And that's what his life is about. And they wanted to encourage him. So they preached, and, and it says there, they did it out of love there because they knew he was set for the defense of the gospel. And he says in verse 18, What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense 
or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. That is, as long as they're preaching Jesus Christ, he's okay with that. Because that's all he wanted anyway. He wanted the gospel further. He's single-minded. And his critics, they didn't get him out of heart like they would me. <laughs> Amen. They, it's not a problem for him. Because he's not in it for a name. He's not in it to be appreciated or respected. He's in it to further the gospel. That's what he's in it for. And the gospel's being furthered because of his affliction and his bonds there. And his critics are talking about him. And they're preaching the right message. And they're using him as a bad example. And his whole deal is, well, I'm just glad to be in there somewhere. I'm glad, I'm glad that they're using me for something. And he says there, as he, as he mentions this, down there in verse 20, look what he says. He says, according to my earnest, oh, well, look, verse 19, I'm sorry. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Now, Paul's there, he's talking about the, the, the matter of furthering the gospel, and there's people there that are doing that by uh, preaching Christ of envy towards Paul, and that leads to strife against Paul. Uh, others are preaching Christ with goodwill, as, as trying to encourage Paul as a fellow minister. And he shows that the one that's preaching with envy and strife is preaching Christ to contention. They're not sincere, and therefore they're preaching a pretense there, and they're trying to add affliction to Paul's bonds. He said the other there is preaching Christ of love, knowing that Paul is set for the defense of the gospel. They're trying to encourage Paul in their preaching and their service. And at the judgment seat of Christ, where not only what we've done is going to be in review there before the judge who is the Lord Jesus Christ and every one of us have that account to look forward to, amen, that appointment we're going to stand before the judge we can make excuses down here one day we're going to tell it to the judge the Lord Jesus Christ and, uh, and at the judgment seat of Christ there he's going to be able to say to Paul, you know what uh, there were some guys that were preaching and their motive, see because at the judgment seat of Christ it's not just what you've done it's why you've done it and it's your motive and the Lord's looking at, hey, you know what? He says, Paul, uh, there's some guys down there that were preaching. You know what they were doing? Their motive was to encourage you. They wanted to be a blessing to you. And there's some other guys, their motive was to outdo you. They were preaching Christ of contention. And they were trying to add affliction to your bonds. He said, you know what, Paul? Not only were you preaching <laughs> and going out there and furthering the gospel, but there were people, their motive in preaching was about you. And he says, you know what? He says, this is going to turn towards my, uh, my salvation and, and my hope there, my earnest expectation and my hope. Of course, you're not talking about his soul salvation. That's already taken care of. His salvation is his. But he says, it's going to add to this. It's going to add to this in the earnest expectation of my hope, which was what? Uh, which, of course, was that he would be found at the judgment seat of Christ, that he had not run in vain or labored in vain. That his life was for something when it came to the gospel of Christ. His life was for something when it came to the glory of God and the light of the gospel. And so he's saying, you know what? This is going to work out for me in the judgment seat of Christ. You know, because he's the motive. He's the motive for a lot of guys that are preaching. Whether they like him or they don't like him, he says, it's all going to turn to my account there. My earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed. That with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. And this is what we're talking about here as we left off last Sunday morning. We think about crisis what we would view a crisis, if I heard that one of you were in such a way that it was a life or death situation, I would describe that as a crisis. And uh, if you found out you were in a life or death situation, you would say, I'm in a crisis here. And uh, of course, <clears throat> most of us would understand. It's life or death, we'd understand that. And looking on the outside of Paul's life, that's what we would think. We would think this is a crisis for him. But notice his attitude there. He's talking about whether it be by life or by death. Verse 21 for to me to live as Christ and to die as gain. See, his crisis was, uh, was his bonds and how they hold him in this life or death situation. But his attitude, again, it's whatever. He's not, in, he's not worried about this. He's not, he's not tore up about it. He's not given to worry about this. Verse 22, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I wot not. For I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. 
Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Now Paul says there, whether it be by life or by death, he, he's, it doesn't matter. I'm, we're going to win out in this thing. I want the gospel furthered, and if they let me live, that's what's going to happen. And if they choose to execute me, that's what's going to happen. People are going to know why I died. <laughs> They're going to know why I was executed. And uh, you can see here's a man that is beholding him who is invisible. <laughs> He's seeing him who's invisible in spite of death, <laughs> Amen. which uh, is very visible. Right? I mean, most of us sitting in here, we've seen death over and over again. We know what it'll do, right? We've seen it. And we all face it. If the Lord tarries is coming, the chances of us dying are 100%. And uh, science and all of its glory never solved that problem. Amen. We will all die. We will all meet our maker. And, uh, and Paul's looking at this situation there, and he's not afraid of death. He's not afraid of it. He's got victory over the fear of death. And uh, for the radio's sake, you know, I, I know there's somebody listening, and they wouldn't understand this. But we Christians are not afraid of dying. I mean, if we're in the right mind, amen, <laughs> we're, not, we're not afraid of dying. It's not a morbid fascination for us. Uh, I'm not suicidal, amen. I don't think anybody would describe me as being depressed. Uh, I've got plenty to live for. That's, that's not a problem. We're just not afraid of dying because, of, you know, even death, you know, they talk about the being the great unknown. For Christians, we really wouldn't describe death that way, <laughs> the great unknown. We know why death has come on all men. Ultimately, it's not because of cancer. It's not because of disease. It's not because of car wrecks and wars. Ultimately, it's because of sin. Sure. Doesn't have anything to do with stimulants and pollution and different things like that. You know, I mean, those things certainly may speed up the process. But the reason death has passed upon all men is because all men have sinned. And death is a sin problem. And the correct that problem that men have with death, the problem with sin has to be solved. And once you get your sin problem solved then the issue of death is no big deal. It's not, it's, it's not, a, it's not a thing to be afraid of, rather. 4,000 years removed from Adam, the Lord solved our, our problem with death and our problem with sin. When Jesus Christ became sin, was made to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And then three days from that, got up from the dead, <laughs> and He's alive forevermore. Now we don't have to worry about death. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Christ, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He's talking about men and just their natural fear of death there. And he said that's one of the reasons he came, and so we wouldn't have anything to fear. He goes on to say in Hebrews 2.16, For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. And when Jesus dealt with sin, he went on to conquer death. And here in Philippians chapter 1, we see Paul, he's laboring in that very confidence that death's not a problem. Death's not a problem there. He says basically, whether it's by life or death, it's all good. <laughs> That's his attitude. He's not worried about it. I mean, as far as what it's going to do to him, uh, he, he's ready to die if that's, if that's the will of God. And here he is, you know, he, he knew his ultimate fate would be that. He understood that. Ultimately, he was, going to, he was going to meet that fate. But if he died, went on to heaven, so be it. That'd be fine with him. If he lived, so be it. That'd be fine too there. He had an earthly job and task there, and he had a heavenly home. And either way it worked out, <laughs> he was going to be fine. He locked his job. He enjoyed preaching the gospel. He enjoyed furthering the gospel. And he was anxious to get home. He was anxious to be with the Lord there. Now there's three things there in this passage I have wrote down in the margin there of my Bible. Uh, and that is the desire that Paul does not fight. The devotion he does not forsake. And the death that he does not fear. 
And that's, that's there in the text, those three things. And uh, it's, of course, uh, here's a man who has, uh, he has his heart blessed looking upwards for that home there in heaven. But he also, at the same time, has his heart burdened about those around him on earth. And so he's uh, got a desire uh, to go home and be with the Lord. Or he has a desire to work for those and see people saved. And uh, that's the desire he doesn't fight. He says there in verse 23, For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And that word straight there, that speaks of something that's compressed there. That deals with him being hard-pressed. He's hard-pressed there. He's, he's in a dilemma of sorts there. He, he uses this term there, being in a straight, as somebody there that don't know whether to turn right or left. And he's in a straight betwixt two. And he's concerning a desire and a responsibility. That's what he's looking at. On the one hand, there's a desire he has. On the other hand, there's a responsibility that he has that God has given him. And he's struggling with the choice of living to die or dying to live. That's what he's looking at. And either way, it's going to be okay with him. And that's what we're seeing in the passage. He has a desire to die. <laughs> he has a desire to live. And, uh, you know, that's something there. He has this desire to go to heaven to be with the Lord. He wanted to be in that better place. But he also had a desire for others to be in that better place. For the glory of God. And so, hey, you know, if he has to go by way of the grave, he's all about it because he knows what's going to happen. As soon as his heart quits beating and his lungs don't take their next breath there, he's going to wake up in glory. He's going to be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He understands that. He says there that he's going to depart and be with Christ which is far better. <laughs> I can say amen to that. Amen. Being with Christ is far better. And to, to be with Him there in that sense, you have to depart from this body. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord there. And that's the struggle He's dealing with. He understands, hey, death, death is the entrance into light there. Death is the entrance into the glory of God. And he's anxious about seeing all that and there, seeing that and being a part of God's glory. But at the same time, there's work to be done. God has trusted him with a job. God has trusted him with a responsibility. And he wants to be a blessing to those saints that are helping him. And he wants to be a blessing as far as the furtherance of the gospel and seeing other people become saints and, and be saved there. And he's ready to fight and defend the gospel in his purity because it certainly had its enemies, those that were against the purity of the gospel. They were adding things and they were taking away things. People were doing the same thing with the Word of God, handling the Word of God deceitfully, he said. So there was things to do. There was a job he had to do. And this is the struggle. This is the straight betwixt two, as he calls it. The result of examining the benefits of dying with a blessing uh, of, of being saved or the matter of staying here and working with the Lord with His blessing on His life there. And that's His, that's his view about life. It's all about if I'm here, I'm here to serve, I'm here to do my job. And if I die, then I'm going to be with Christ, which is far better. That's the way He viewed life there. And He's going to allow His service to follow at the judgment seat of Christ. And, uh, and His life was one with meaning. It wasn't an easy life. Anybody can see that. But it was one with meeting. Uh, he, his mission statement is verse 21. For to me to live is Christ. To die is gain. And you'd expect anybody that was to stand in this pulpit to say that to you today. Because it's the truth. Amen. You would expect me to say that to you today. And, and, and such. But let's not look at me. And let's not look at every other preacher that would stand up here and say that. Let's look at the text. This is a statement that Paul makes from his heart. And it's. It's the Spirit of God bearing witness to it. This is his mission statement. This is his motive. This is his motto. Life is about Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. It's about the glory of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the a, that's a greatest statement as anybody can make. I don't know what the meaning of life is to you. Sometimes I wonder what it is to me. Amen. The heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. And there's a, we're like onions. <laughs> You know, we can have several different motives going on at the same time. And, uh, and sometimes you think it's all good. You think it's all right. You got the right motive. And then you get to peeling that thing away in your prayer closet and confessing some things to the Lord. And just in the matter of exposing your heart to the Lord, you begin to realize, hey, wait a minute, there's a little bit of self-preservation in that. It ain't just for the Lord. 
And there's a little bit of self-service in this. And, and, and it's hard sometimes. And maybe that's the way it always is. Naturally, there's going to be that motive there. And you try to distinguish yourself from that and make sure that your main motive is for His glory and, and for the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul there, he is saying this, and the Holy Spirit is a man in this when it's put down in Scripture. For to him to live was Christ. That's what life is about there. A great preacher F.B. Meyer said this. He says, Jesus Christ is the essence of our life. He's the model of our life. He is the aim of our life. He is the solace of our life. He is the reward of our life. <laughs> you know what he just said? It's all true. <laughs> it's all true. You know what I've got? I've got a good wife, and I've got been blessed with a house full of children. And uh, happy is the man, you know, whose quiver is full of them. And I've been happy. Amen. I thank God for my kids. I thank God for a good marriage. I thank God for, you know, for friends in the ministry and all that. But I've known people that's got everything that I've got. And they're miserable as a poison dog. Because they didn't have the Lord. <laughs> they didn't have a relationship or fellowship with the Lord. And folks, that's what makes everything sweeter. Listen to me today. You may, I'm, not, I'm, I'm speaking as a fool, and I say this fearfully. Lord, have mercy on me. But we don't need our spouse. Because they have the Lord. He said, well, I just don't know what would happen to me if this happened and that happened and everything else. You know, it's good to think like that. The fear of the Lord is still the beginning of wisdom. It's still the beginning of knowledge. It's good to realize your whole world is in His hand. And if He blew on it and all that was left standing there is an ash heap and you sitting on it with three buddies saying you had it coming, <laughs> He'd still be the Lord, you understand. The fear of God, that's, that's just good sense, folks. You know what I know? I know this. If I had, but I didn't have any walk with God, and His peace wasn't there, His joy wasn't there, and His trust wasn't there, I'd be miserable as a poison dog. You know what makes life worth living? It's Jesus Christ, folks, and that's a fact with my hand. Everything else is just the cherry on top. Life is the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I, when we're on a good track of happiness and peace and focus and fruitfulness, we know that. And when we get messed up, we forgot it. And that's the fact. Every time we get messed up, we forget. Life ain't about that job. Life ain't about that person. Life ain't about my health, amen. Life ain't about riches. Life ain't about position. Life's about Jesus Christ. Paul said, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain." When we forget that, what happens? We get entangled in things. Trying to make it. Trying to get ahead. Trying to get something. Self becomes the same. You know, that's, that's really the problem with the ministry today. Generally speaking, I know there's some good, godly men. And they preach the truth. I don't mean to malign every preacher sometimes with my state blame state. But there's some guys, and they're the ones that are out front as far as the world is concerned, that the spirit of the ministry is about self. And it's self-motivation and self-improvement and self-help and, you know, self-promotion. you know promotion. And it's about self. And the subject of the Savior is to frame what self wants. You know, that, that, that's true what I just said. They want the Lord to make them happy. They're not going to try to make Him happy. They want Him to make them happy. And that's what life is to them. It's about for to me to live is self. That's what it is. And the Lord's here to make me happy. And that's the way they think. But that ain't Paul's attitude. Paul's attitude is for to me to live as Christ. And folks, when you and I start living for self, we get entangled in the affairs of this life. That's what happens. You know, there ain't anything more miserable than getting tangled up and having your way hedged about. Or rather Moses talked about Israel when God's judgment got in the way there when they got unfocused. He said he's going to hedge up the way with thorns and darkness and they're going to get stuck there. And just, That's a miserable way to be in life. Just get hung up, stuck, marred up. You can't get out. 
because it's a dead end and there's no hope of getting out. That's the way some folks are as far as their life is concerned because it's all about self. Living for self is a dead end street. It always is. And, uh, and it's bad when you frame that there with the Lord. You say, well, I, I'm living for the Lord, but really your motive is about self. You know what Paul said? Paul says, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Somebody that's about self can't do that. It gets hard and they'll quit. It gets hard and they don't like it. They, they just refrain. I'm not going to do it. I was trying to do right and this happened. <laughs> I was going to church. I, here I was. I was living for the Lord, preacher, and I was going to church. I even started tithing. <laughs> and, and wouldn't you know what? I got laid off. I just quit going to church. I said, what's the use? <laughs> well, what is the use? Well, why were you tithing? Why were you going to church? Was it self? <laughs> and that's why you got out when they, you can go your way? Are you here to honor Him? Are you here to worship Him? Are we here to meet in His name? Hey, didn't He die for you? Ain't He seated at the right hand of God the Father alive forevermore? Isn't He worth your life? That's why we're here. Why is it we get out of heart? Because it didn't go our way. Because of self, that's our motive, folks. That's it. Paul, he didn't have to go his way. He'd have people in the ministry talk about him. Take with him as long as they keep talking about Jesus Christ. He'd have folks there that were preaching, trying to encourage him. That's all right. It's okay. He said, I'm just looking ahead to the heads of city Christ. It's for his glory. It's for his honor. He, he's dealing with sickness. He's dealing with betrayal. He's dealing with folks that misunderstand him. He's dealing with folks that misrepresent him. He's dealing with Jews who hate him, that he himself could wish himself a curse from Christ for their salvation. I mean, nothing's going this guy's way. Read it. <laughs> I mean, everybody, this gospel of prosperity, claim it, brother. You'll be rich and wealthy and healthy and all this stuff. Here's Paul. He's sick and he's broke as Job's turkey. And he's in bonds. And he has some of the brethren that can't stand him. <laughs> you know what he's doing? He's preaching Jesus Christ because he says, that's all it's about anyway. For to me to live is Christ and to die <laughs> is wonderful. <laughs> it's gain. To be with Christ is far better. That's what he said. But he said to abide in the flesh. That's more needful for you. That's that devotion. He wouldn't forsake. Hey, I'd like to be in heaven right now, he said. But you know what? I got a job to do. And if the Lord leaves me down here to do this job, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do it. That's his motive. Amen. It's just like Joshua. He said, look, I don't know about you. He says, if it's, and I love this. I love this, especially down south. I wish, I wish God would just hammer it to us and bear witness to it. He says, if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose something else. Right? That's what he said. Down here, man, the peer pressure is so that we got to put on the dog. If we're not interested in serving the Lord and living for Him, we still got to act like we are down south. Listen, if it's just an act, go home. <laughs> Quit it. Amen? <laughs> Don't put on the dog for anybody. You know what he says? If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, go ahead, serve with somebody else. He said, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. He said, I can't make your choice for you, but I'll make my choice for me. He said, matter of fact, I'll make my choice for my family. <laughs> we're going to serve the Lord. <laughs> you know what Mrs. Joshua said? She said, amen, <laughs> we're going to serve the Lord. <laughs> amen, I like that, I like that. You know what Paul's saying? Paul's saying, I can't speak for everybody else, but for to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's his devotion. Living equals Christ, and Christ equals living. And he's, I don't know why the rest of you live, but I know why I'm living. My lungs are going to draw their next breath for him. My heart's going to keep beating for him. I'm going to keep swinging away for him. And when this fight's over, I'm going to be with him. <laughs> that's his attitude. And that's the death he does not fear there. He's not afraid to die. I mean, it's, I'm, it'd be an understatement for him to say death's no big deal. And I don't mean to say that because that's not true. He said to die is gain. <laughs> it's a big deal, amen. <laughs> Only it wasn't a bad deal. It was a good deal. He just wanted to get as much time out of this life as he could so that when he died, he'd be better. That's what he's looking at. Now, the last point here, let me, let me finish up here, and that's the faith of the gospel. That's in verse, uh, uh, verses 27 through verse 30. He said in verse 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. 
For unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Paul, when he spoke there about the fellowship of the gospel, he's talking about family. You're partakers of my grace. And he's talking about the brethren. It's family. They're, they're sons. When he talks about the furtherance of the gospel, he's speaking in terms of service. We're servants getting the gospel out. When he talks about the faith of the gospel, he's talking about preserving the integrity of the gospel. It's purity. And he's likening it to being a soldier. You're soldiers of Jesus Christ. You're His sons. You're God's sons. You're servants of Jesus Christ. And you're soldiers of Jesus Christ. And it's not just about family. Let's all get along. Amen. <laughs> Got to love each other. But we don't always have to agree. Yeah, listen to me. If you, add, if you add water baptism as part of the faith of the gospel, you are preaching heresy. And I'm not being hateful by calling you on it. We can disagree, you understand? you got to love me anyway. <laughs> but, but somebody adds one thing to the finished work of Jesus Christ, they're guilty of heresy. And we got to strive together, you understand, with one mind. You know what he's saying? Get on the same page and protect the integrity of the gospel, the faith of the gospel. That's what he's encouraging them to do. That's talking about standing fast at attention, at your post. Stand fast. And striving, that's fighting, that's overcoming, and suffering. There's a reproach to this. There's suffering. Not in America, I doubt it's going to, you know, well, it may get that way. It's not that way right now. Where we're going to the le limit that he was suffering. But I mean, can't you bear the reproach? <laughs> I'm not talking about you getting chained up. At least not right now. <laughs> I'm not talking about that happening right now. No, really, I'm, I don't know. I don't know if we'll see that. I don't. I mean, the Lord comes today, and we didn't see it. That'd be good. Amen. <laughs> I'm, I don't think I'd make for a good martyr <laughs> unless the Lord just gave that grace. I read what those guys did when they were in the fire. I read what those guys did when they were in prison for years upon years. I just don't think I could do that unless the Lord gave me some grace that I got right now. <laughs> I think I'd be quite a bit of a different story. I like uh, uh, James and Marty Heffley as a married team. They wrote the book By Their Blood, and it's a continuation of Fox and Book of Martyrs. Not near as romantic <laughs> as the Fox and Book of Martyrs. I mean, you got accounts there in history where somebody's burning in the flame, and as a testimony to those that are around of God's grace on him while he was suffering, he washed his hands in the flame as it was cold water. While the flesh dripped off of the skeleton there, he was washing his hands in the cold water. One man said, I'll signify to you, brother, I'll clap my hands three times if the Lord gives me grace in the fire. And that Power went up there and everybody stood there and everybody at first, you know, there was a lot of murmuring and then all at once it just all got quiet as that fire began to crackle. And as everything got quiet there, that man started clapping three times in the middle of that thing. Now you read James and Marty Heffley, it's a little more up to date. And uh, you got missionaries running and screaming through the jungle, people mowing them down with machine guns. It's a different story, amen. They're still martyrs. They died for the Lord Jesus Christ. They got shot in the back, though. They were, they were trying to get out of dodge. That'd be the way I'd go, amen. You'd have to catch me first right now, unless the Lord just gave a man to grace. And I don't know. I don't know that we'll ever see that, folks. I don't. I know this. If you'll speak up for Jesus Christ today, you'll bear reproach today. You know why? Because if this hadn't dawned on you, it should. This world hates Jesus Christ. And that's a fact, folks. This world hates Jesus Christ. When I was, I'll quit. When I was 16, the Lord laid on my heart the burden to preach. What I surrendered to when I was 16 was the idea, God wants me to be a preacher. And it led to me having some doors open for me to preach. What I'd seen there of the ministry, I'd seen a preacher get in the pulpit and he preached and he told a joke and everybody laughed whether they thought it was funny or not. Oh, that, that was still the way, amen. <laughs> Just a courtesy laugh over down there, right? It, it didn't matter, you know, if he told a story, people were entrenched, you know, and stuff. And my idea of the preacher, that was, that was then. And, uh, and I knew that that's what the Lord wants me to do. And I didn't see myself that way and I wrestled with it and all those kind of things. But 
That's what I thought the ministry was. That's really what I thought it was. And what happened was, you know, I got some opportunities to preach. And before every time I'm in a youth meeting or whatever, before I ever preached, some guy would get up here and he'd say, listen, we've got Gilbert Carey with us today. And he'd begin to talk about high school and football and a bunch of blah, blah, yada, yada, nonsense stuff. And it's just hard to sit there and worm through that, you know, but it's just corny syrup stuff, you know. We're so honored to have this young man with us and all this stuff. You know, here I am, I'm 16, 17, 18 years old, and just trying to read my Bible every day. There's a lot I don't even suspect, let alone know. And the doors were open back then, man, as long as I didn't know anything. <laughs> just get up and just talk about how we're supposed to love each other and, and, all, <laughs> and, and give a testimony. That's all they wanted. It was okay. But what happened was our, uh, Brother Gary and Brother Ray Howard got me in the street ministry. And uh, here is this deal there at Scott High, you know. Um, wasn't a great student, but teachers loved me. They did. I loved them. They, I didn't have a bad relationship with any of them. And, uh, and the kids, you know, I mean, it was, I was friends with everybody. That's the way it was. And, uh, you know, played sports and things like that and was, was somewhat known for that. And we got out there on the street preaching. First time I ever preached. You talk about a guy praying for the rapture hard. I was praying for the rapture or a car wreck on the way over to Camel I didn't care. For the Mary to live was cross. Yeah, right. To die was gain. That's right. But I'm on my way to Campbell County and Scott High's play in Campbell County. And I'm one year out of high school. And I got out there on that street corner. And kids from Campbell County parked in the parking lot behind me. And they laughed and turned up the radio and they made fun of everything I said. And guys coming through from Scott County stopped at that red light and looked at me. And I seen teachers doing this. <laughs> and I seen kids laughing and then looking away, friends of mine. And I went home, folks, after that, preaching out there, embarrassed. Embarrassed. And I was embarrassed as I went out on my back porch to pray. I, I most of the time had a house to myself because mom and dad worked in Devonia Mountain. They were gone all week long. And I went out there and I, I laid down on the back of that porch there on my face. And I had to tell God, I said, Look, Lord, I was ashamed of it. And I was, a, I'm ashamed that I was ashamed. I'm embarrassed that I was embarrassed. And I don't know what to say. And listen, before that night was through, folks, here's what I realized. Preaching ain't some guy up here under the lights making everybody laugh and everybody appreciates him. You know what I realized? And I've realized it a thousand fold since. This world hates Jesus Christ. And if you don't know that, you've never went beyond these doors with a gospel message. And you never talked to anybody other than another Christian or somebody that had questions or doubts. You talk to somebody that they don't, they don't want to talk to you about this. You're going to find out what they think about these things. And they're going to bear reproach. Because the Lord said, go get them. Highways and hedges and compel them. Go after them. Throw that net. Get out in the water with them. Wait out there. Go after them. That's what he said. You go out there and you preach at a fair side or you preach at a, some gathering and like we do at Gatlinburg. Ain't nobody came to hear any preaching. They came to get away. They're there with their family. They don't have, you're there preaching out loud on the street corner there. Of course they think you're crazy. And of course you get on their nerves. And the guys there trying to sell things and they start registering complaints and all that kind of stuff. He said, what's the problem? The problem is this world hates Jesus Christ. That's the problem. They don't care if you're here this morning. You understand? You're here. You're within these walls. You go out there. You're going to find out. You start waving his banner. You start letting that light shine. Darkness doesn't appreciate it. He said, they hated me. They're going to hate you too. That's what he said. And you know what Paul said? Paul said, that's all right. I ain't worried about that. To me, to live is Christ. To die is me. And that was his devotion. All right, we'll stop right there. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. And uh, Lord God, for the thing.